bubbles, dark basement, scuttles, and nails. Hi witches, I'm here with Mary Ann Beacon today at her lovely little healing center, Elderberry Clinic in Peterborough, Ontario. We'll talk a little bit about her clinic and the work she does. But to me, it's really interesting how people get on this path. So we're going to dig into that a little bit. And I'd love it if you introduced yourself to us. So my name is Marianne Beacon, and I would say I'm actually here by mistake, really. (laughs) (laughs) If you had told me 25 years ago that I'd be doing what I'm doing, I would hardly believe it. I was actually on a path to try and become a midwife. And there was something very deep in me that wanted to learn by apprenticeship model. So I did a couple, maybe a year and a half apprenticing with a midwife back and forth between BC and here, and then ended up spending some time with a her and it just sort of bumped me onto this other path of, of working with herbs. And I would say that everything I've done since is, it's a fine balance between feeling like I was sort of nudged in certain directions, feeling an impulse to f- explore something, and just having it open up and not really knowing where or why. But now that I'm sort of 25 years in, things are sort of blending together. And it like makes much more sense why I pursued that path or that path. I would say primarily I'm a herbalist, but I've also studied Reiki to the Reiki master level, studied Bowen therapy to the instructor level. I did a psychotherapy program, but didn't uh, actually become a psychotherapist. The process that I was following in that education was more experiential, so it helped Mm -hmm. me. I say it as helping me in my process. I've also studied more recently death doula class. My herbal life has taken many twists and turns, and right now I'm focusing primarily on a more alchemical approach to making medicine, and I make all my tinctures as spagyric tinctures. Which, of course, makes me think of a million things I want to ask you, but let's start with the first one. Do you see yourself as a witch? And if not, what's your definition of a witch? Yeah, you told me that that question might come, and I really have thought about it, because to me, the way you define a witch is pretty much everything. So I don't practice Wicca, but when I think about how I've come to understand who has been called witches in the past, people who were persecuted for being witches were often women who were independent, who were maybe outspoken, who were healers, all of that. If I define somebody who's a witch as that, somebody who's strong in themselves, somebody who follows the natural world, who takes divine inspiration, who has a close relationship with the earth who watches the cycles of the moon, then yeah, absolutely, I'm a witch. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's really interesting in society that people seem to be coming more and more to the realization of how important all those interconnections Mm. are. And I'm sure you notice it working with your herbs. Are you growing your own herbs as well? Some of them. Mostly I try and, and grow things that I really need to harvest fresh. But there comes a point where I've had to make a decision where you know, already I've got so many things on my plate with teaching, making medicine, seeing clients, all of that, that a lot of the herbs that I use are bought from like an organic. But I I do feel that the time is coming where like every time I meet a farmer, especially people who are growing organically, I'm trying to encourage them to expand their choices of not just growing vegetables. And I am working with somebody and he runs an organic farm nearby here. We're just starting to plan like what things would be planted. You know, he needs guidance because he's more of a vegetable farmer. So we're kind of collaborating there. And then you have more power over what you're getting in your shop, right? Nothing more frustrating than when you spend all the time to like start or seed and plant and then it just dies. And yeah, (laughs) you know, you're not going to have it. (laughs) So did you start out with just regular tinctures and then move to spagyrics? And you told me you went to a course about spagyrics. Is that how? So this is kind of where the magic happens. Like to me, I think magic is partially about seeing connections and then synchronicities, right? At the time when I started getting involved with spagyrics, I was teaching a clinical herbalist course. I had met somebody who did spagyrics with some um, volunteer work that I was doing prior. But I was taking my first class, my first group through this clinical herbalist course. And towards the end of the first year, I was asking everybody, okay, what are your thesis? Like, what are we, you know, let's talk about what you're going to write about next year. And one student said, well, I want to write about spagyrics. 
And I was just like, oh, no. Like, <laughs> how am I going to mark a paper if I don't know what spagyrix is, right? Yeah. That's what I'm thinking inside. And like literally three days later, I'm on Facebook. I see my friend in Nova Scotia who does the spagyrics. And he says, I'm doing a course in July and come out if you want. And I was just like, okay, I'm there. I signed up and literally that weekend blew my mind over and over and over again. Could you just give a quick definition of spagyrics for people who have never heard of them? Spagyrics is the herbal branch of alchemy. So there's many different ways that you can make medicine from different substances. And alchemy includes many things like plants, minerals, metals, animals, whatever. But spagyrics is more the branch that focuses on plants. It's the safest branch as well. You know, we don't talk about alchemy a lot in the podcast, even though it's one of the oldest written forms of magic. And I see a lot of it being carried through in present day magic. I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Historically, alchemy was really, um, they had to protect it in some ways because it was also under attack during the whole witch burning times. Mm. So anybody found to do that might be at risk of persecution as well. So a lot of the old texts became like, they use a lot of drawings to explain processes. And so there's a lot of imagery that gets used, a lot of symbolism, a lot of language that could easily be interpreted other ways. So the old alchemists were kind of, people would put them down for wanting to turn lead into gold. And often people, that's the, they skim the surface and that's all they want to do with it. Because that's all they think it is. But really, the gold is on the inside. And when you're working with the herbs in these ways, when you're following these processes and using like this, where the moon is at or where the planets are at and honoring this plant in this way, Essentially, we take the different parts of the plant apart, and then we put it back together. So you're clearing certain things like, you know, we live in this world, we all sort of take in some, some of the toxic elements of this world, and the plants do too. So essentially what you're doing, when we put it back together, which is called the marriage, it's like the most pristine parts of itself. And so it really honors that plant to be in that state. And when we're doing the work outside, it also affects you inside. You get lessons, there's times you get blocked outside, and then you have to look inside. Why am I getting blocked with this part of the process? So it's almost like a spiritual practice. Oh, absolutely. It changed my life. After that weekend, everything started shifting. Shift, 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 shift. And it's like three years now, three, almost four years I've been, since I've been doing that. And it's like, I feel like I'm unrecognizable to myself, except that I'm more myself than I was before. It sounds like you were going through the alchemical process yourself. It almost uh, sounds a little bit like a satori, which is like the Buddhist term for a temporary awakening or the beginning of an awakening. So this was the experience you were having when you went to this first workshop to learn about spagyrics. Could you explain to us a little bit about maybe the Coles notes on how spagyrics are made? So to make a basic tincture, that's the easiest way to explain. The way we make a basic tincture The old way was that you take your herb, you put it in alcohol or a combination of alcohol water, let it sit for a month or however long, and then press it and use it. But this is what blew my mind is I always thought I was using whole plant medicine when I was doing this. But what I learned is that when we throw away that extra herb, we're throwing away almost all of the minerals. And in alchemical language, that's the body. So you're throwing away the body. And so what people are using is more maybe the spirit and soul. But how do you embody that medicine you're taking when you've thrown away the body of the plant? So what we do with the spagyrics is we take that herb and we burn it. And we burn it and burn it and burn it until it's like a fine white ash. And then when there's like no sort of color left, all the carbon has burned off, we use distilled water to pull out all the minerals. And you reconstitute it all back together. Is that yes. Yeah. So when we We get the minerals pulled out. There's chalk and minerals in that ash, right? Filter out the chalk and then they evaporate the water. And what's left are these crystals. The minerals are a crystalline structure. We can put those minerals back into the tincture. And what it does is it activates all of the constituents. But then we're also doing things ideally in alignment with the planets that are ruling the plant. 
So that's where some of that like astrology comes in, the magic comes in. Yeah. Um, and do you do astrology outside of the planetary days and the planetary hours? Or do you just try to focus in on like picking the right things at the right time? <laughs> I wish I started studying astrology 25 years ago. <laughs> that's how long you need to study it, essentially. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm probably working at a pretty basic level. What you do is the certain steps you might do under the influence of a planet in the planetary hour or the day. And I think we should mention for our witches that might not be aware, there is a benefit for picking herbs, either from your garden or foraging on the appropriate day or hour uh, of their planetary rulership. So that's something you can look up online. And as well, there are herbal books, um, something like Lee Lehman's Book of Rulerships will speak to which planet is associated with which herbs. If you want to add a little extra magical punch to your herbs that come into your home. Because you're picking that herb or doing a certain process with that herb at the point when it's having its planet shine down on it. Mm. So yeah. it accentuates that part of the plant, its strengths. So I think when we talked originally on the phone, just about magic versus energy, was magic something that your brain always went along with? Or was there a period where you had to cross over into that kind of thinking? Because you seem very scientific minded to me when I talked to you. <laughs> so I wasn't sure if there would be a dissonance between magic and energy work. No, there's no dissonance for me. I actually feel like I tend more towards the woo-woo side, but my process in that is that like when I started working with herbs, it was, um, right now herbs are really trendy. Yeah. Her recently. <clears throat> yeah. And recently and everybody sort of, and their brother wants to be a herbalist, but oh, <laughs> <laughs> like literally I get so many inquiries about studying, but so I got into this, people didn't really know like, what is a herbalist? Mm-hmm. And when I opened my practice and started to really promote my practice, it was like 2009, I guess. I was doing Bowen before then. Is Bowen, it's sorry, like... It's a hands-on technique. Okay. Massage type technique, or is it a... light massage. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's like... Anyways. So when I first started to open my practice, when I told people I was a herbalist, they would either say one of two things. They would say, are you a witch? (laughs) Or they would say, are you a pot dealer? So for a while, I publicly had to sort of push that away just to be like, no, I'm a clinical herbalist and try and get people on board. So I had to sort of sequester that woo-woo side into my private realm. And make it seem very scientific and Mm -hmm. okay, just to get the quote unquote credibility. And now I don't care. Like, (laughs) (laughs) you you can think what you think. I'm not going to make everybody happy, whatever. So I'm more... Like I'm diving into other topics, doing distance work, working with crystals more, studying water. Oh my gosh. Is this like the frequency water stuff or? You should check out Veda Austin. She's really amazing talking about how water communicates, how it has a language to itself Mm -hmm. and how you can like learn from water and how there's like a whole bunch of stuff. Water carries memory, water. And you do flower essences. Do they take on the energy of the flower? Before, I didn't really understand how it worked. I was just following the process. And then I started studying water, and I was just like, oh, the water is taking the imprint of the flower and holding that message of the flower. And then we preserve the water with brandy and try and capture that. Essentially, like a lot of what we're doing is working with the elements. Yes. And it's interesting because in astrology, water is like the emotional communicator. That's how people interconnect, whereas air would be like the mental connector how you pass messages but in alchemy we're using all of it you're bringing it all back together we're using water we're using fire it's all represented and the salts of the earth yeah what i find really interesting when you think about pills where essentially they're just taking away everything but the medicine quote unquote medicine and yet it has so many negative side effects and it reminds me of what you were saying about regular tinctures how they're acidic, your body doesn't absorb them as much. So it's like when we don't honor the wholeness of something, it suddenly becomes like a poison in a way. You know, we kind of swear by these pills, but then 10, 20 years down the road, you see all these negative side effects of being on a long-term heart medicine or a long-term lung medicine, something like that. So is the idea that spagyrics, because they're more holistic, they don't have those side effects that go along with them? 
I mean, you still have to choose the right plants for the person. Yeah. But you're using the whole plant, and so that means you're using the whole wisdom of the plant. And when you talk about those medications that you're, you're speaking of, they're isolating one thing, concentrating it, and then trying to use it as a medicine, but they're eradicating. Like a lot of plants will have a constituent that has an effect, but it'll also have the antidote within that or a mitigating factor within that plant so that you can use it without having the side effect. Most plants have anywhere between five to 10,000 constituents. Wow. So if you're going to isolate one and then concentrate it, you know, of course something might become carcinogenic. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the death doula because I think that's something that's coming more to the forefront. I've seen a lot more about it. And what was it that drew you to it as well? Well, as I age and my clients age and some of them pass away and I realize, wow, some people come for many years and what would I do if they come to a point where they're starting to die? So I just wanted to inform myself a little bit more initially. How do I be with somebody? How do I support them along the way? Some deaths are sudden and unexpected, but some of them take a long time to come to pass. And now when I look at what's been going on through this pandemic and I see what's happening in the medical system and things are really strained, all the stories of people dying in the hospital during the pandemic where they were completely alone and they were not allowed to have any family members. I just wonder maybe if people are going to start to bring death into the home again allow their loved ones to die at home more rather than in this like medicalized death. And when I think about like how spiritual a birth is and how important it is for some people to birth at home so that they can have the birth that they want in the environment that they want. Well, why wouldn't we do that for somebody transitioning on the other side and allow them to have a peaceful environment that isn't full of beeps and lights and strangers coming in every 20 minutes. You know, why wouldn't we allow that too? I think we've become very afraid of death because it's no longer in our homes. And having a relationship with the death and dying can help us to, you know, brings that into the topic of like a non-taboo subject. It's become this taboo subject and it happens over there. Now, I haven't really started practicing as that yet because of a lot of reasons. Because you have a lot of different things going on. Yeah, it's yeah. not my own only focus. But one of the things that has started happening, and this is maybe a little bit on the edge. I've also done a lot of psychedelic healing for myself. Mm-hmm. and It's very popular right now, too. It's growing as a field. And it's helping us to raise our consciousness. When you think about the fact that trees and mushrooms are heavily related and they're finding out there's this interconnection in how they communicate, it's, it's similar to the microbe thing. We're starting to realize there's these interconnectors in our worlds that will make our lives better instead of villainizing them. Right? Yeah. And so one of my keen interests, psychedelics, primarily mushrooms, because they're really good when it comes to alleviating depression and anxiety due to the impending death. <laughs> you know, figuring out the loss in their life, all of that. And also just coming to connect with something deeper that isn't, you know, there can be less fear if you can kind of interconnect with that whole web of life of what's on the other side of this consciousness. You were telling us in the beginning that first you were considering doula and then you were considering death doula which are two transitions that no one can really understand. Do you know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. it's interesting to see how that all plays together in where you are now. Do you think that you have a desire to understand the hidden parts of things or the... Oh, absolutely. To me, that shows up in my life in dreams and just symbolism that the earth speaks. I've had some pretty amazing experiences in the forest where the earth is giving me a lesson of some kind. I get messages from my dreams all the time. What's one of the biggest lessons? Something you'd be willing to share? (laughs) I mean, this past week, my dreams told me, okay, time to do a bit of clean out. Better get some gentian and clean that liver out. Like it can be that. It was all symbolic in the dream. But when I worked with it and pulled it out, I was like, oh, this is about me and my liver and springtime is coming. And I need to like literally the plant gentian came up in my dream. It almost sounds like a form of divination. Do you know what I mean? Like you're finding the answers in symbology. How do you interpret your clients? How are you figuring out what people need? To me, I would say that our intuition is informed by our learning. The more we've learned about, the more our psyche can speak to us. So as I'm listening to somebody talk about 
their troubles, whatever they're concerned about, usually plants are coming up in my mind. That's and I cool. just write them down as, and by the time we get to the end, sometimes it's like, I've got four plants and I'm like, oh, those are the four plants. And sometimes there's like 15 or 20. I'm like, okay, now we have to fine tune this. And get <laughs> You're this. not just going to make a really big tincture? No, no. <laughs> I think I just mostly listening and trying to, one of my jokes about myself is if I started over what other thing, what I do in life is if I wasn't doing what I was doing and often it would be like, I'd be a detective. To me, I actually think I am a detective, yeah. but it's just with people's health. And to me also finding the starting point is really important. The reason why I went into studying psychotherapy and shamanic stuff and all these other things is because as I got into talking about people's health, it's like, oh, I just start to see some sort of mental emotional thing that happened or trouble that's spurring this body thing. Oh, it's the spirit that's unwell. It's spurring these body symptoms. It's never just, to me, the fact that we only take people's blood and x-rays is like, it's so shallow. You were telling us before the recording about how mental health professionals have been sending you clients. Could you tell us a bit more about that? So more on that story is that I ended up getting aligned with a psychotherapist who really likes spagyrics. And so he sends a lot of clients. So he's working with them in that sort of counseling way. But he sees that they're having something that he might feel might benefit with herbs. So he's been sending them to me. And so now we have been doing this for at least a year. And the thing is, um, emotional or mental issues do play out in the body because somebody is distressed in some way. They are going to have physical symptoms. They're going to have tightness in their chest or anxiety plays out with they can't digest their food or headaches. Like there's so many. It's just the physical weakness is where the symptom shows. But the root is the emotional or mental emotional issue. That's why I was asking about the fermentation thing, because I've been thinking a lot about the biome and how they're doing more and more research about how the mental is connected to the physical and the messenger is somewhat related to the microbes uh -huh. in the body. It speaks to what science is missing these days or what medicine is missing is we just are so bent on killing everything that's not us. Something we have to keep in mind, and this is what I remind myself often, is that medicine is very young. They're like a that's toddler. True. And if you compare it to like alchemy or even herbalism, like herbalism has been around since the beginning of time. Since plants and humans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we've grown up with plants. We have been, we share more DNA with plants than any other animal. Oh, really? We are made of that which we consume. And most of what we've consumed is plants. Yeah. Wow. Or we consume the animals that consume plants. We are not separate and herbalism far predates Western medicine. Yeah. And it will far surpass it in the future, right? Yeah. And people are going back to it because they're realizing some of the things that this Western medical system has been doing is really toxic. It's toxic emotionally with a power system top down. Are you noticing a big difference with the spagyrics for these clients? Are they reporting? So what's really interesting is because sometimes he and I speak not directly about clients, but just about what we're yeah. seeing. And what he's seeing is that the herbs are really helping while they're going through their counseling process. But what I'm seeing is that because they're in a counseling process, it's helping them to become more aware of the herbs are able to work better because they're actually working with the prompts that the plants are encouraging. Yeah, so it's they're more really, conscious. Yeah, it's really synergistic and people are getting a lot more help. Yeah, it's um, almost a shame we can't work that more into the psychiatric model. That's the thing where in this society, we've been living under a model that has made pretty much everyone quite unwell in some way or another. Yeah. And even the most healthy specimens of us humans still have issues, right? We still have like traumas to work through or physical ailments to work through. To me, I think it takes all the ways. It's not just one way. Like I wouldn't say what I do is the one way, the only way. My view is if I'm going to bring any sense of spirituality into it, I'd be like, there's however many people there are on the planet. There's eight billion paths to God. <laughs> and one way isn't better than the other. But we're all going to find, hopefully, like some people are getting lost right now. But that might be part of the journey that they're on to find something about themselves, right? So I don't want to diminish it because there are some really terrible things happening. People are sinking, but people are also 
right to swim (laughs) right and sometimes you have to get to that bottom before you can go up to push off of yeah yeah Yeah. you, you have to like it's you know carl Jung says you have to bring the darkness into light essentially you have to go in there to see what's in there and often when people discover is the jewels and that's what we're doing in alchemy is we're pulling the jewels out of the plant with the herbs, I'll ask you what your favorite herb is <laughs> today. Well, I'm going to challenge you on that too, because if we say the word favorite, it means that one thing is better than another. Mm. And that is actually very masculine and very patriarchal. <laughs> to me, a relationship with the plants is also a relationship, interconnected relationship. And those plants are interconnected with each other. And Often we work with formulas because they work together synergistically to help a person. So this tea that I've given you is high on my list. I make this tea quite often, but it's not one herb. There's four herbs in there. So we're drinking (laughs) holy basil, rose, damiana, and licorice. I knew it was sweet. (laughs) Yeah, the licorice is sweet. What's my favorite herb? The one that I'm currently working with. You know, I have a great big vat of Solomon seal tincture that I'm finishing. It's pretty sweet. It's pretty tasty. I don't know. Like, I have 100 herbs on my shelf. It's kind of like saying, which is your favorite child? Like, (laughs) when you first started the herbalism, was there one herb that made you realize, like, this is the direction I'm going in? Or was it more the effects of how herbalism was working with people? Because I hear a lot of people are spoken to by an herb. Just that one herb speaks to them and suddenly they're like, this is it. This is where I'm going to go with my life. Now I want to speak about three herbs, but (laughs) that's okay. That works because there's different (laughs) stages in my life. So when I chose the name of my business, I called it Elderberry Herbals. To me, choosing Elderberry at the time, I was pretty young in my practice, but I knew then that I was entering into a practice that would take me until my dying days. So I wanted something that I could grow into, the elder. And the elder tree pretty magical plant and it was the plant that people would plant in their gardens to oversee all the other plants and to be the elder the elder plant is the elder of the plants to me that became special and there's many parts of the plants that can be used in many ways i would say personally i found a lot of help from saint john's wort but that was like more early on just for some of the things that i was experiencing saint john's wort really helped But I also had a very interesting experience recently with Lobelia, and I would say it helped. Like I started studying it because I was trying to find a selection of plants that could help me. But if I was sitting with somebody in psychedelic, like with mushrooms, and they started to sort of get really off balance, I wanted something that would help just to sort of mitigate whatever was going on. And in my studies, I came across Lobelia. And found out that we use lobelia to open the airways. It's a bronchial dilator. Right. It helps with asthma attacks. It helps to, it's a strong nervine. It helps to calm the vagus nerve in particular. Mm. It also supports people who are trying not to use nicotine. So that's all my scientific learning, like for my studies. But when I was kind of diving into like, how do I support people? I found out that people used to use lobelia for getting entities out. Or oh. protecting yourself from an entity. The church actually used to use it for exorcism. I was going to say, it's an exorcism or Cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Get the demons out. Yeah, absolutely. And I actually feel like I had an experience of that without getting into too many details, but had a personal experience of that plant having that effect on me. And I'd had a massive clearing by using that plant. Do you feel like it was an entity or a curse or it was just like an energetic something inside you that was not what is supposed to be in there? I don't know. I'm still working through it because it just happened like in the fall. So I think I was close to somebody who was sort of carrying a big entity and I was exposed to it. I was getting too close to that. I just had this experience where there was an expulsion that happened and maybe it was my grief and maybe it was often we're looking for one answer, but so many times there's many answers, right? There's layers and layers of answers. So that's why when people say, oh, which herb worked? Well, I only want to try one thing because if I try more than one thing, I won't know which thing worked. Again, that's like a very patriarchal way of thinking. They want to stab it. They don't want to yeah. <laughs> work with it. And when, I say, when people say that, I'm like, okay, like, let's think holistically about this. You need to eat well. You need to drink water. You need to sleep. You need to breathe. You need to do all of these things, not just one. Yeah. For me, I find that the biggest limitation 
Do you find that challenging in your business, getting people over the mm-hmm. hump of you got to do the big change? See, that ultimately what you're talking about is empowerment. And we have been suffering with this patriarchal system for a very long time that is extremely disempowering, especially towards women. And so when you finally stand up and you say, okay, I'm going to take care of my health and choose what that looks like, that's an act of empowerment. Some people just aren't there yet, and that's okay. Sometimes there's benefits to rolling around in the dirt and having people help you because you're rolling around in the dirt. But we don't have a system that really helps people to see all these things that they're doing. But even if you did say, sometimes people just aren't at that point where they want to see it, can see it, whatever. It's not me to judge where somebody's at and what they're doing. Yeah. Do you ever experience, or did you when you were first starting, experience something like imposter syndrome? Because I know for a lot of people, that's the limiting factor. They hit that and they're like, nope, I don't know what I'm doing. Did you ever have to deal with that, work through that? Usually on a fairly regular basis. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) To me, that's like, I think it's really easy for people to also get lost in sort of like that guru symptom as well of being like, oh, I know everything. The enlightened ego. Yeah. Yeah. So to me, that imposter syndrome is actually a very useful tool to make me check myself. And have I done enough for this? Do I need to recheck something? It keeps you accountable. Yeah. That's smart. Something that I learned in in my psychotherapy learning is that there's seven core wounds. Hmm. And one of them is the not good enough wound. So if somebody's bumping up to that, they're bumping up to their wound. And anything that we are going to do in the work is going to show us what our wounds are. If you know that, then that means you have the opportunity to say, oh, I have a core wound here that I can do work on. Rather than hightailing it out of there, then you like launch into the work of, of addressing whatever that core wound is. And then the other question we like to ask is, do you have a witch gift? A witch gift. Yeah, like an ability that just comes naturally to you that maybe seems a little bit different than what other people can do. What I would say is like it's about making connections. To me, magic is happening everywhere all the time. Mm -hmm. And you see the magic because you're noticing the connection. And if you don't see it, it's because you're not aware of it and you're not paying attention or you're not fine-tuned to view that. So I guess I would say sometimes I notice a lot of little details, but then can go back out to that bigger picture and figure out how those interconnect. And it's really useful when I'm like trying to help somebody with their health. Sometimes it's a bit of a curse. Because you know what's going to happen before it happens. (laughs) In my personal life, it's definitely a curse. Yeah. You know, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us about this, Marianne. I think it's really important that other witches see representations in the community of how they could be practicing or thinking about their acts of magic. Could you let our listeners know how they could find you? So I practice in Peterborough, Ontario, if you need to come in person. But I also see people on Zoom for herbal consultations and stuff like that. And what website can we find you at? You can find it under my name, mariannebeacon.ca, but I have elderberryherbals.ca, elderberryclinic.ca. You bought all the elderberries. Yeah. <laughs> In house, you actually do the diagnosing, some Reiki, Bowen, and then herbal suggestions for how people can treat their illnesses. Is, is there anything else I should add that you... Well, I do flower essences flower as essences, well, yeah. and I have a new offering that I've just introduced recently mm-hmm. called a flower essence healing session. So I have this kit that I've built where I, I use it as a testing kit, and I can do that in person or by distance. And actually, sometimes on the phone, it's like the best because then we can I just have the person be nice and relaxed wherever they're sitting. It's a healing session, so it's not we can't really use the word diagnose. But it's not like choosing, it's using the energy of those plants. And I include the flower senses and the tinctures and the other spagyric medicines that I have. Mm -hmm. So using them energetically as a response to whatever the person's feeling based on their concern. And so I would have them think about their concern, test what things would help, transmit them energetically. So that's where the Reiki comes in, the distance work, and then wait until it shifts. And usually like we just keep going. 
Oh, it's shifted. Okay, now we're feeling. Now we test again. Transmit, wait, shift, wait, shift, and keep going. And often what happens is this like we're spiraling around until we kind of find this like little nugget at the core of whatever. And then, you know, at the end, we can build a formula based on what would help them to sort of integrate and maintain whatever change or whatever awareness they've built from that. And then you also do courses as well. Are they in person or are they online? What's the format for most of your, depends on the course. Because we've been stuck online for so long, we've, some of us have tried to move into some in-person work. So I do have a class coming in the spring with another herbalist that's like a just a basic medicine making course Mm. that we go through all the different kinds of herbal medicine making except the spagyrics because that needs its own little thing i'm working on doing a flower essence class in june that i haven't published yet i know among our witchy group the topic of flower essence has come up could you tell us a little bit about it yeah i've made like 250 flower essences at this point essentially you're putting them in water in the sun to capture like the sun the goes frequency. through yeah. and goes into the water i've heard that you're not supposed to touch the flower when you make this Is you know i or... went to a workshop out when i was in alberta somebody helped me to sort of break down that as well because i find that again that was designed by bach who's a man who's a scientist and a homeopath and blah 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 and so it's really rigid and this woman just was like, well, if you touch it, it means that your energy is in it. And is that, is there something wrong with that? Like if you're coming at it from like a place of being. I'm toxic. My energy can't touch anything. Yeah. When so, you're literally the healer working with the people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've softened a little bit about that just because I find that these are the kinds of things that interfere with our ability to make medicine. And we just got to get over that. It's time to just make medicine and. And help whoever wants healing to heal, because we're, we're in a bit of a mess here right now. Very good note to end on. Make sure you check out marionbeacon.ca and check out her courses. She sells her remedies online, so mm-hmm. you can order there. And don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe us on whatever app you're listening to. And we'll catch you later. Bubbles. Dark basement. Scuttles. Garnails. 